everyone and welcome to Division of Career Pathways and GPS STEM's Career Transition Series. This is our third series where you're going to learn about the uh, recruiter's perspective. In the past, the ones we organized, we gave you our experiences, we gave you what's the best practices and how you should be uh, tailoring your message on LinkedIn to be those candidates which recruiters notice. Now, this is a part where we really want to hear from what recruiters think about LinkedIn profile. We could spend forever hours telling you what, how you should be building and tapering your LinkedIn profile, but unless we hear from the experts who are gonna be looking at your profile to hire you, it doesn't mean much. So therefore we have our speaker who's a recruiter and um, we'll introduce her shortly. She's gonna talk about those aspects. But I would like to first thank Lauren Lyon from Division of Career Pathways for helping us organize this uh, part of the transition series. And some of you may already know Lauren, but if not, I'll give it to Lauren to go ahead and introduce herself and uh, take it forward. Sure. Thanks, Surrender. Hi, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Lauren Lyon, as Surrender said. I am the Graduate Career Counselor here at UCI, um, and I do a ton of work with GPS STEM. If we haven't had the chance to meet, I hope we can soon. Um, and it's my pleasure today to introduce our um, guest speaker, Jasmine. Um, I'll let Jasmine do her intro and bio, but she is the operations manager at PSE Biotech, and she was also a former recruiter manager. So she's going to give us some really great insights um, as to how recruiters view LinkedIn um, and how maybe you can make some subtle changes that might make you stand out a little bit more. So uh, Jasmine, with that, I'll pass it on to you. Thank you so much, Lauren. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for allowing me to join you during your precious lunch break. I hope you all have something yummy to eat um, while you listen to my presentation. <laughs> um, I also wanted to start by thanking the team over at the UCI Division of Career Pathways with Lauren, Harinder, and Carol as well. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Jasmine, and I'm going to be speaking with you all about what recruiters want and provide a perspective on finding the best candidates on LinkedIn for recruiters. So we'll briefly go over the agenda. I'll start by providing a bit of insight into my background. You probably saw that I'm working with operations right now and are probably really confused as to why Lauren asked me to speak with you all. So we'll kind of go into that. Um, we'll also dive into LinkedIn and the role that it plays in today's society. I'll provide a snapshot into what LinkedIn recruiter actually looks like and what recruiters do when finding candidates for their roles. And then we'll go over some ways that you can become more marketable to recruiters and essentially take your profile to the top of the pile. Uh, finally, we'll go over a few interview tips and tricks. So, can anyone guess what school I graduated from uh, for my undergraduate degree? I don't know if anyone's on mute, but um, I think oh. everyone's on mute. Yeah. So, uh, do you want me to run a poll? Or I, I, based on you know the data, okay. what I see, a lot of them are UC Irvine, and there are a few people from UCSD, and they are mostly uh, uh, PhD yeah. students. It looks like they're coming in with the chat saying, all guessing UCSD. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yep, I went to UCSD for my bachelor's in psychology. Um, I had a focus in cognitive psych, which really allowed me to understand the human brain, human interactions, and human connection. Um, after I graduated from my undergraduate studies, I joined a small pharmaceutical company and ran to Cucamonga called Amphistar Pharmaceuticals. So Amphistar is a specialty pharmaceutical company that's engaged with the development, manufacturing, and marketing of generic and proprietary injectable intranasal and inhalation products. Um, some of their popular drugs include naloxone, which is an epinephrine injection for mus intramuscular injections. Um, they also have enoxaparin, which is their, actually their top seller. Um, you also may have heard of Primatine Mist, which is an over-the-counter product used for temporary relief of mild symptoms of intermittent asthma. At Amphistar, I performed a human resources role, um, and in this company, human resources performed all of recruiting as well. So um, I was not only able to learn HR, but I was also allowed to learn recruiting. Um, while performing this role, I realized I really enjoyed recruiting. Um, I love making connections with people, helping them find their dream jobs, and I don't know how many of you can relate, but I'm one of those people who loves crossing things off a checklist, even if it's a grocery list, and 
to me, recruiting kind of was that where every requisition I felt um, there and that one person got their dream job, one manager got the resource they needed, and one recruiter was able to cross the requisition off her list. So this is kind of where everything came together. Um, I joined PSD Biotech as a recruiter in 2017, and essentially I became this person. Um, I reviewed hundreds of CVs daily. Um, I had 25 to 50 plus calls every single day. And this is kind of where the recruiting process starts, at least from a candidate's perspective. And recruiters will review resumes, hop on phone calls, screen and gather requirements, coordinate interviews, and finally, and hopefully, we find you your dream job. Um, while I was working at recruiting, I got really involved in various parts of the company. Um, and, I, and that was because as a recruiter, I worked with all departments and all managers. So um, it was super interesting to learn about the moving parts of a company and how each role had a bigger impact on the overall organization. And since I was so involved, um, my supervisor had asked me if I'd like to join him on our operations team and build our project management office. Um, this is currently what I'm doing, and that's why um, I'm currently in our operations team, um, but, sorry, my dog is right here, um, in our operations team, but um, I was, most of my career, I was in the recruiting field. So, moving forward to the role that LinkedIn plays. As I briefly alluded to, we get hundreds of resumes daily. Um, and with the growth of LinkedIn and its impact on the recruiting world, the number of applications has increased even more. LinkedIn is currently the world's most popular careers and recruiting tool because it allows job seekers, recruiters, uh, sales professionals, marketing professionals, and regular industry professionals to network and get connected. Um, today, we're gonna focus on two main users of LinkedIn, and that's going to be job seekers and recruiters. So job seekers primarily utilize LinkedIn to find jobs. <laughs> they have access to job boards and can reach out to hiring managers and recruiters directly. They also have access to industry groups, industry news, um, company information, and they have the ability to view staff within companies that they're interested in. Um, job seekers have much more power than they used to through LinkedIn as they can view connections and ask for referrals and introductions to key players in the hiring process. Now, recruiters primarily use LinkedIn to find candidates. Um, they also gain efficiency by being able to reach out to people with the perfect skill sets directly rather than simply having to wait for applicants and hoping that somebody with the right skills apply. Um, recruiters can search for specific skills that hiring managers um, require and can fast track the hiring process. So this is what LinkedIn recruiter looks like. As you can see, um, recruiters are able to source for specific job titles, locations, skills, previous and current companies, years of graduation, schools, industries, and employment types. And the more details that a recruiter inputs, the smaller the range of a candidate that comes up. So when I was a recruiter, I would always cast a small net. I started with all skills and requirements that the hiring manager provided and looked for people who were perfect. Um, if I reviewed each profile and reached out to each qualified candidate, I would widen my net from there, take out some of the nice to have requirements and only keep the must have requirements and then go from there. Um, if I didn't find the person through that search, then I would open it up to um, people who are um, in a different industry or maybe in a further location. Um, that's kind of how I worked along my process. So I started with the perfect candidate and slowly expanded my search. Um, you can also see that um, there are a few different tabs here. Um, there's a total candidates tab, more likely to, likely to respond, open to new opportunities, and have company connections. So people who fall into the more likely to respond tab are going to pe be people who follow your company page. Um, people who fall into the open to new opportunities tab are people who selected the open to new opportunities button in um, your job seeking preferences. Um, and then people who fall into your have company connections tab are people who have first degree connections with people who are currently in your organization. So those who fall into these tabs, not the total candidates, um, are probably going to be where recruiters start off when they do their recruiting process. 
because these people are the people who are more likely to respond to you. Um, and as you can see, even 537,000 is significantly less people to look through than 4 million candidates. So that's kind of where people start off. Jasmine, we have one question which is relevant here, if you wouldn't mind asking, uh, answering. Is that okay, Pat? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, so Ohi, he's our alumni. Welcome, Ohi. Ohi has a question. Do recruiters use skills listed on the job posts for searching for candidates? Or are those yes, skills not often listed on job posts? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll kind of touch base on that in a bit, but we totally um, look at job descriptions to um, source. So the reason why is because recruiters are not complete experts in this job. So if I'm looking for a specific engineer, um, I'm not an engineer. So um, I have to be able to refer, reference the job description and look at the keywords that I see there to really get an understanding of what this person does. So I'll take keywords from the job description, from my intake call with a um, with the hiring manager. Um, I'll take those key things, and then that's where I would put in. Um, that's what I would put into the skill section. There was one more thing, Jasmine. Like when you say are most likely to respond, is that I may have missed it. Is that based on how active people are on LinkedIn, or like LinkedIn is there an algorithm based on which LinkedIn would give you those people who might respond sooner compared to others? Yeah, so the more likely to respond is actually people who are following your company. So um, if I go to UC Irvine and I follow you on LinkedIn, I would fall under this cap for um, a UCI recruiter. So it's whoever follows your company page on LinkedIn. Okay. We have one question from mm -hmm. Caitlin. This is really good. Uh, do recruiters often use location as a limitation? I'm considering moving back to the East Coast after I graduate. So she's at UC Irvine. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Caitlin. Yeah, so recruiters use the location section a lot. So what you would be, um, what I would recommend is to put the location of the area that you're planning on moving to, um, if that's where you want to look for a position, because they do limit you. So for example, there is, you're able to put San Francisco, or you're able to put greater San Francisco area and it'll kind of widen the search pool. However, you're not able to write Northern California. You know what I mean? So it's um, the amount of limitation that your LinkedIn recruiter will allow you to do is limited to greater metropolitan areas and the city itself. Um, they also do it by zip code sometimes. So if you have a zip code, I can say within 50 miles of this area code, um, I mean, the code then um, LinkedIn will find that net of people, but it, it won't allow me to say, oh, I need people in Irvine and the East Coast. I can't do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll go to the next tab. And this is, now that you've got to see what LinkedIn Recruiter looks like, you'll kind of um, be able to see what recruiters look for when searching for candidates. So how to take your profile to the top of the pile. So the first thing you should do is complete your profile. Um, if you view your profile, you'll be able to see a profile strength meter. Um, if your profile is complete, you'll receive an all-star profile ranking. So you want to check your profile and ensure that you are an all-star. You're also going to want to input a headshot. This doesn't need to be a professional or paid headshot. Any picture that has your face and has a fairly nice lighting and is a neutral background with the fight as shown by Mr. Jeff over here, who was the CEO of LinkedIn. Um, you're also going to want to input a headline and summary. Something simple like X role at Y company is simple and straight to the point. Don't put in words like guru, ninja, wizard, as they aren't ever going to show up on a recruiter search. Um, recruiters don't look for ninjas unless you work for the coolest company ever. Um, they typically search for researchers, engineers, microbiologists. So you're not doing yourself any favors by saying you're a wizard with coding. Um, you're, gonna, you're going to want to write you're a software developer. Um, the people who have these um, like more unique titles, um, they have it because their purpose and their goal for LinkedIn is different. They're usually the marketing people. They're usually the recruiters themselves um, because you want to attract um, like people to you in a different way. Um, the goal is different. So, and so then there's some, 
sorry, sorry. Uh, there's a very relevant question, and Christina stole my question. Is it okay to write PhD student in your title or PhD candidate at UC, whatever? It, how do you guys view that? Yeah, I would totally highlight that. So you can write PhD student, candidate, either way would work. Um, the key word that you would see is PhD. And so um, I think either way would work out. Um, you can explain it further within your profile as to what you're doing before your headline, keep it simple, um, write what your kind of, um, what your current role is. Great, thank you. Of course. And another simple um, trick is to update your LinkedIn URL. Um, if you have a long URL, even though you can hyperlink things in your resume, um, it doesn't come off as professional and clean and memorable as it can be. Um, you can do this by editing your pro public profile settings page and your account settings. Next, you're gonna wanna tap your open to new opportunities button. Um, this is going to be the simplest way to get re recruiters to reach out to you. Recruiting is time sensitive, so you want to, we want to get in touch with people who want to talk to us. Um, your current company recruiters can't see the open to new opportunities button, so if you're currently employed, I'm worried that your employer might see this, they won't. Um, only people outside of the organization that you're associated with can view this option. You're also going to want to follow the company that you're interested in. So as we discussed earlier, there are tabs that narrow the list of qualified candidates for a role, and one of the most commonly used tabs is the likely to respond tab. So just by following the company that you're interested in, you can bring up the amount of your profile being viewed exponentially. Um, yeah, like right there. <laughs> Um, and then next, you're going to want to make connections at the company that you're interested in. Um, you're, you can go to the company profile and see who you're already connected to. Um, send a con if you don't have anyone that you're connected to, send a connection request with a brief message. It can be as simple as, hi, I'm impressed with your background. I wanted to connect. A lot of the times, people are happy to connect, and once a first-degree connection is made, it's much easier to start a professional relationship. You can ask for insight into the person's job, you can ask how they like working, uh, working at this company, et cetera, et cetera. And from here, um, this can naturally lead to a referral or an introduction to key players in your hiring process, um, rather than just, um, you know, waiting or very directly saying, hey, I don't know you, but can you refer me for this role? Just start a conversation and keep it um, naturally flowing so that it can become an, uh, a very natural referral process. Um, next thing you can do is explain any gaps. If you have any gaps in employment, explain it in your profile. Rather than getting rejected prior to even speaking with the recruiter, explain your gap in your profile. For example, if you were um, doing some research and you didn't put it on your profile, um, put it there. If you were studying for a certification, put it there as well. Write June 2019, September 2019, I studied for the um, EIT, for the engineering training. Um, and I received the certification on this date and my license ID is XYZ. If you explain your gaps, recruiters will most likely reach out to you rather than ignore your profile and assume you were out of a job or even being lazy. Next, you're gonna wanna list out your skills. These are the keywords. Um, and you do wanna compare it against the job description. So, um, Jasmine, how, one quick, sorry. Yeah. In terms of gaps, I think this is very relevant and we get asked this question a lot. Uh, some people take break due to family reasons and maybe it's paternity, maternity leave or paternity because of, you know, anything. Uh, is, mm -hmm. How do you explain that kind of a thing if anyone had to? Yeah, you can, um, of course, that's a personal situation. So it's really what you're comfortable with. But honestly, that's what I would write. Like, um, I've, I've hired people with five years of um, a gap and it's because on their profile they were was being was working on being the best father possible to my um, newly born child and that's what they put for their work experience and i thought that was fantastic and it, it explains why you're not currently um why you have a gap in experience um i would keep it it really depends on what you're comfortable advertising but um I recommend to put something along those lines or just even saying family leave 
something similar um, where you don't have to explain too much, but um, you can kind of say, hey, I was doing something for my family at this time. Jasmine, a, a similar question, a little bit broader. Um, why do recruiters care about employment gaps? Yeah, so there's a lot of different reasons why recruiters care. Um, and part of it is hiring managers want someone stable. And with if somebody has a lot of gaps in between their process, um, it doesn't mean you're unstable. However, it can lead to that perception. Um, there's also maybe there's a gap in knowledge that, um, you know, that doesn't show that you are consistently developing yourself. Um, there's a lot of different implications, not that I agree with them, um, but that's kind of the perception that um, it can portray. We have one question from Kara. If you have gaps between undergrad and graduate education and worked at a job that is not related to field you're in now, would you include that? Mm -hmm. I responded, I feel like maybe it should be, but I really want to know what you think. Yeah, so I would still put it. And um, I always say there's always something that you can learn from every single thing that you do. So for example, um, if you worked in an um, administrative role in between um, your undergrad and your graduate school, talk about what you learned um, during that role. Were you, were you people facing? Um, were you um, doing a lot of data entry? What did you learn there? And how does it apply to how you can support um, you know, your next company? What skills did you gain through that? What did you find was important? Are you able to relate to people better? Are you able to see the importance of accuracy when you're writing something? Um, there's always a skill to be learned, no matter what, if you worked at a movie theater, if you worked as an insurance agent, no matter what it is, even if it doesn't apply, there's ways you can word your resume and ways you can show your personality that um, goes beyond the, just, the job of, um, just the job title of what you did. That's great. Does thank that answer you. your question? Okay. Yes, yes, thank you. Good. Please go ahead. Okay, sounds good. Um, so like we were saying, um, you'll want to input your keywords. Um, I'm sure you've all heard horror stories about recruiters spending seven seconds per resume or profile and that we have the scary applicant tracking system that doesn't even allow resumes to reach seductive recruiters if they don't contain keywords. Um, these horror stories do contain some truth. I don't practice this methodology and I don't believe in it. However, it's very fairly common in the industry. Um, the reason is that recruiters are extremely busy and it is a very time sensitive role. Recruiters work a minimum of 10 hours a day, upwards of 12, 16 hours a day. They work every single weekend. It's a very high paced um, job. And because everything is so time sensitive, um, they have to lean on these automation techniques. Um, to get your profile in front of as many recruiters as possible, you need to beat the system. And how you do that is fairly simple. Um, you'll want to research a few job descriptions for the role that you're interested in and companies that you're interested in. Um, so look at their job descriptions, compare it against your profile. Recruiters are going to search for words based on the hiring manager's request, which come from job descriptions and intake calls. Um, so having a profile that matches the words on a job description will boost your chances of getting viewed and um, getting contacted. Um, another thing you'll want to do is input details regarding work, research, volunteer experience. We kind of touched base on this, but you don't want to leave your profile blank. Um, you're going to want to input any research experience, capstone, volunteer experience um, that you participated in. If you don't have anything to input, it's not too late to start now. Join a professional group, join a research group, join some type of um, you know, um, networking event, somewhere where you can get involved and add it to your profile. So uh, Karen wants to know, are the skills, the skills within the skills section or under your experience section? So for the um, Details regarding work, this is going to be the actual um, job section. So it's going to be details of what you did. Um, skills are going to be under the actual skill section. Um, but both ways, um, either way, you're going to want to compare it against the job uh, description. That's great. Thank you. Of course. 
Um, another tip that I have is to focus on impact rather than explanation. So you want to write your profile and cater your profile to your audience, um, which is the recruiter or the hiring manager. You know what you did and the impact that it made, but the reader may not if you just list out what you did. So you should write ways, uh, write your profile in ways that shows the impact rather than step by step of what you did. For example, if you look at this um, example, it's um, revised training program for Project X versus reduced training program um, training time by 50% and raised revenue by 25% while revising the training program for Project X. And you can make this related to your research, your uh, internship, whatever it was, there was an impact made. There were things that you progressed. There were um, things that you did that may not show up from just having this description. Um, so if you were a recruiter, which one would you reach out to? Um, you know, it's really the one that made the impact. Um, you're going to want to demonstrate how you can make impact at this new company and ease any pain points that they have, right? Um, um, you're also going to want to ask for recommendations. If you don't have any recommendations on your profile, ask people you interned for or did research for to write one for you. Um, if your work shine, um, a lot of the times um, they will be happy to write one for you. And having recommendations on your profile give recruiters insight into your work ethic, working style, soft skills. Um, most people tend to highlight technical skills on their um, actual profile. So having this additional section where people not only mention your um, stellar work capabilities, but also talk about your soft skills um, is going to really um, be an additional um, source of recommendation for you. And it's going to, um, you know, allow recruiters to reach out to you more. And finally, you have received endorsements. Endorsements are also great because they serve as mini recommendations and also come up when recruiters search for keywords. Um, you can always ask people for endorsements or you can endorse others and hope that they return the favor. Jasmine, before we jump into the next slide, we have one more question on gap. Um, mm -hmm. In your opinion, what would be the average length of a gap that you would need to address? So for example, if it was two months, is that fine to leave not addressed? Um, what do you think? Yeah, it really depends on every company. Um, I personally do not, um, like, I only care so much about larger gaps just because that's something that I do have to explain to the hiring manager and say, hey, this is the reason why they have this gap in employment. Other companies do care about even a month of a gap. Um, it really depends on the company that you're catering to, so you'll have to use a judgment call. Um, yeah, it, it, it really depends. But in my personal opinion, I would say anything beyond three months, you should explain. Um, anything below, it's not too big of a deal for me. Uh, uh, Jasmine, there's one question related to recommendation. Um, uh, we have a clear mm -hmm. uh, differentiation between recommendation and endorsement. I believe endorsements are for skills, specific skills, which probably pop up in your profile. And recommendation is mm -hmm. almost like a recommendation letter. I had a question related to recommendation. How long should the recommendation letter is? And I totally agree that recruiters don't have a lot of time to read through, like, you know, how the actual recommendation letters are being submitted by your advisors to different things. But should it be like short, succinct, you know, to the point? Uh, because one time I asked my uh, graduate thesis advice to write that, and she wrote two page uh, recommendation, and I was like, I don't know, if this is right. What do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, so I also agree, keep it brief, keep it concise. If it's an actual letter that you're submitting to, like an, um, not a recommendation on LinkedIn, but an actual recommendation letter, um, it can be longer, it can be like two paragraphs or so. But on LinkedIn, I would say three sentences, four sentences, um, you know, I think that's totally fine. It just hits the main points um, and that way people can briefly read your profile and see what key skills that you have. Yeah, if it's two pages, I would not read the whole thing. <laughs> okay, thank you. Absolutely. And so now we're going to go into tips and tricks for interviews. So first thing is always research the company, the interviewer, and the role. Um, and the role is the job description. 
You're also going to want to double check the address of the location that you're supposed to interview in um, just to make sure you're at the right place and you're able to arrive about 10 minutes early to the interview. Um, if you show up too early, the interviewer may not be ready. He or she may be in meetings or in the middle of a task. Um, and also, if you come exactly on time, um, it may appear as though you're unprepared. Um, practice interviewing. Prepare by um, practicing general interview questions. While practicing, you may realize that you have verbal tics or that you speak very quickly. I am definitely um, somebody who falls into both categories. Um, so practicing for your interviews can help you um, pinpoint areas that you want to improve. Um, some phone etiquette tips is always to put your phone on do not disturb mode so that you don't get interrupted during your interview. Um, address yourself um, when meeting your hiring manager. Say, hi, my name is Jasmine. Thank you so much for taking the time to meet with me. Um, this allows the hiring manager to know who you are and also shows your preparedness. You're also going to want to enunciate. Um, speak loudly and clearly. Make sure you're doing your best to communicate your strengths and experiences. And also, be confident. Um, this is your time to shine. Emphasize your skills and portray your experiences. Your resume got you the interview, but your interview will get you the job. So be strong, be confident, speak to your experiences. Um, and finally, use the hiring manager's title. If they have a doctorate, respect the title and call them Dr. Blank. Um, another thing is, once again, I just want to emphasize this again, but emphasize your skills and experiences. Interviews are not the time to be modest. Um, relate all questions you have to experiences that you have. So show your ability to relate to the hiring manager, um, to the questions that he or she is asking, and to the role itself. You're also going to want to come with three to five questions to, um, to ask. So if some get answered along the interview process, you still have a few left over that you can ask at the end of the interview. Um, take a few seconds to collect your thoughts and provide detailed responses that showcase your strengths and experiences as well. Um, you're also going to want to connect. Keep the conversation flowing, answer questions thoughtfully, and pose questions when appropriate. Um, you're going to want to engage. Don't just, if a hiring manager asks you a question, don't give them just a straight answer. Relate it to your experience. Say, hey, um, I actually came across something similar to this when I was doing my research at under this laboratory and kind of go through that process, how you solve that, how you're analytical, how you um, are a problem solver. These are all ways not to just answer, be correct, but also show that you have the right traits to um, succeed in any role and um, succeed when you encounter any issue. Um, be, eloquent, be eloquent when speaking. Speak about your experiences and how they relate to the company and position that you're interviewing for and sell yourself. Um, showcase your fit within the department, the organization, and the job in general. Um, I always say go on to the company's um, homepage and view their mission. Um, you can usually find it in, under the About Me section. And you're going to want to kind of briefly uh, mention it so that hiring managers know that you did your research, that you came prepared, and you show how you fit into the organization really well. And also, don't speak until the hiring manager has finished asking his or her question. Um, if you have something to say, um, you can quickly jot it down and mention it when it's a good time to talk. Um, always ask insightful questions, come prepared, um, and show that you did your research, that you're listening to everything the hiring manager is saying, and show that you're genuinely curious about the company and the role. So as the hiring manager is speaking, if any questions come up, jot it down and ask about it. Um, it shows that you're able to engage, that you're really listening, that you're really taking everything that the hiring manager is saying as important news, and that you're really uh, trying to relate it and show that you're going to succeed in this role. And then last but not least, follow up. Um, always follow up by sending a uh, thank you email to the recruiter or to the hiring manager if you have his or her contact information. Um, you can always ask the recruiter um, or the hiring manager's email if they say, hey, it's company policy, we don't show those up. That's totally fine. Just um, send a, say, oh, great, well, no problem. Here's an email that I wanted to send to the hiring manager. Can you please forward it over? And I'm 
100% certain that they will. Um, and this also just leaves, um, you know, a really good impression of the per uh, of you at the end of an interview. Shows your great follow-up skills and that you're going to be very um, easy to work with, not just with the manager, but with other people within the organization. And that concludes my presentation on what recruiters want and recruiters' perspective on finding the best candidates via LinkedIn. Thank you all for allowing me to um, share my perspective. Um, are there any other questions that came up? We did have one come in regarding uh, salary and when to bring that up for during your interview process. Yeah, so what I would always do is um, when, when you have your first call, kind of ask the person, hey, what's the interview process like? How many phone calls? How many interview rounds are there? And that's going to kind of help you determine when to ask that question. Um, generally, for me, I like, I like to discuss it um, kind of just to get your expectations in the beginning. Um, but of course, you're not going to know exactly what, this, what you need from this, uh, what salaries you need, because you're not going to know exactly what you're going to be doing until you finish your interview, right? Um, a job description can say something, but as you talk to our hiring managers, you might realize the job entails a lot more than you thought, or it's maybe uh, you know doing a lot less than you thought. And so that's going to allow you to um, really um, scale the range that you want. Um, but typically, I like to um, you know get it get a range in the beginning and then work towards a goal towards the end. Thank you, but Jasmine. I would. Yeah, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Finish. I always say be transparent. Um, like I try to be 100% transparent with my candidates and I um, work really well with people who are transparent with me. And we always, um, and you're always gonna wanna partner with a recruiter who has your best initiative in hand. Um, and so when my candidates tell me, hey, here's what I'm targeting, I say, okay, let me tell you um, what roles we have that are fitting to this salary range. Let me show you um, what this, and consists of, what the role consists of, um, you know, you're going to want, want to find a recruiter who's truly your partner, not somebody who just wants to, you know, hey, like, I'm, I, you go there. Like, you don't want that. You want someone who's going to be your partner and have your best interest in mind. Thanks. This one question by Ohi, regarding skills, LinkedIn has three top mm -hmm. skill options. How do you decide mm -hmm. which top three skills to select? Yeah. Um, I would say it really depends on the role that you want. So when you look at, I don't know what role you're looking for, but for example, if you are a project engineer, right? Um, at that point, you're gonna wanna put the three main things that come up when you look for a job description in a project engineer. Um, and it sucks that that's kind of how it has to be, but that's the way that you're gonna get noticed the most. Um, and partially it's because recruiters are not project engineers. Um, we don't we're kind of relying on what a manager or a job description or our online research tells us. Um, so that's kind of where you want to follow it and put the top three of, um, you know, the top three skills that generally pop up when you're looking for that role. Great. Um, I think this is an interesting one because I am sure Lauren, or maybe you get that a lot too. Um, this is about, what do you think about people contacting you inquiring about or for an eventual opportun opening or opportunities. How useful, appropriate is to contact a recruiter in LinkedIn when not applying for a job? Um, I always welcome it. Um, I always, and to this day, I'm not a recruiter, but I still get people reaching out to me and I still take time to talk to them. Um, and sometimes that may be, it has to be a reasonable amount of time or a reasonable request because we also are working a lot. Um, but I always say candidates first, employees first, and that's kind of the um, motto that all recruiters should kind of have. Um, but I personally talk to every single person. Um, if you're a candidate who reaches out to me, um, whether I refer you to the right person, whether I say, hey, at this time we don't have anything, but here's um, our recruiter's contact information, or when I was a recruiter, I would definitely talk to every single person who reached out and tell them, okay, hey, like, here are some things that I have right now. Here are some things that may be coming up in the future. Um, that's, I think it's normal and I think it always plays in people's favor. Um, worst case scenario, your recruiter doesn't respond to you, but at least you tried. Um, and best case scenario, somebody does reply to you. 
but I always welcome it and I always think it's important. Um, LinkedIn is all about networking. So whether you're looking for a job or not, you should be making connections and utilizing the platform that you have. Great. Um, I had, I think this gets asked a lot and that is about, let's say if you come across a job on LinkedIn and sometimes LinkedIn shows on top right corner who the hiring or manager mm -hmm. recruiter, hiring manager is. Is it appropriate mm -hmm. to contact hiring manager sort of like, if you're just asking for, I, I don't know, what's the best way to do it if you really want to do it or but before that, is, should you be actually doing that? Yeah, I always recommend it. Generally, they don't put hiring managers, but they put the hiring recruiter. So the person working on the requisition, um, um, so it's your HR person or your recruiter that they usually link. I say reach out. Even if it's just a, hey, like I apply for this role, just, um, you know, um, like I, was, I wouldn't say send an email as soon as you apply, but maybe a week later or so, just send a quick follow up in mail or email and say, hey, like um, just um, I submitted an application for XYZ role, I'm super interested in this um, opportunity. Um, here are some key points as to why, um, you know, I think we'd be a great fit for each other. Um, you know, here's my content information. I look forward to hearing back. Something very simple, not like a, once again, not a super long email or something, but, um, you know, follow up that does get recruiters' attention. And if I receive 100 resumes for this position, I personally do look at every single resume. Not everyone does. Um, but, you know, if somebody reached out to me and followed up, I'll definitely look at that resume one more time, you know? Um, so it's definitely, in my opinion, a good way to get in somebody's, um, you know, to get somebody's attention. Even if that recruiter doesn't respond, I'm pretty sure they at least looked at your profile again. Awesome. We have one question from Christina. Sorry, Christina, I forgot to ask her. It just got lost. Um, it is related to recommendations. Uh, who should you focus on when you ask for recommendations? Someone who's your boss or higher up or is a coworker okay for a recommendation as well? Yeah, so I personally think if you can get a recommendation from your supervisor, that's gonna be your number one selling point. Um, coworkers are totally fine too. However, they don't carry as much weight. Um, team members who are on a project with you, all, like any recommendation is great. However, it doesn't carry as much weight as somebody who is senior to you. So if you can get somebody who's senior to you or somebody who, um, you know, um, like who you're serving, so not like your boss, but for example, if I am a salesperson and a client wrote a recommendation for me, um, that would be very, very beneficial. If, um, you know, if whoever you're targeting, um, depending on your role, um, that would make a big difference. So for example, if you're a researcher and your role uh, R&D works um, directly affects quality assurance, right? Um, and a QA person wrote a recommendation for you on how well what you did um, supported the QA person's role, that makes a big difference. So it really depends on the relationship, but I would say somebody who's, um, who is kind of above you or somebody that um, was directly impacted by your job, um, that would make the biggest impact. Great. Uh, we have a follow-up question from Christina. Maybe I can answer some part of it. But um, follow-up is, what if your advisor is not on LinkedIn? And, and just, Jasmine, just to give you a mm -hmm. uh, uh, perspective, a uh, lot of principal investigators or PIs under whom uh, students and postdocs work with are not on LinkedIn because they don't believe in mm -hmm. LinkedIn because they did not find the job while LinkedIn. So that's why they are not on it. Or even if they have mm -hmm. a profile, they never update it or they put a picture of lab code. Um, you know, that's a profile picture. So, uh, uh, Christina, I, I would say like if they are not on it, uh, then what's the even point? But even if they are, if they are not active, you know, you could always a lot of times you write a summary, send it to them. And if they approve, um, and this, that's what you want, you can upload it, but make sure that they have, a, they have an account. But the other question is, um, is a postdoc you work with okay? I, maybe you can tell me, Christine, uh, Jasmine, if I were to put it like, I am asking for a recommendation from someone who is a slightly higher up within the same company I'm working in. Is that considered okay? 
Yeah, absolutely. Like I say, even um, recommendations from colleagues are good. They're great. Um, it's just if you want that heaviest weight, get somebody who is your supervisor. But like for me, for example, I report to the COO and he does not write recommendations for anybody. And so, uh, you know, even if you're his top employee um, from all performance reviews, that doesn't get shown on LinkedIn, right? Um, and so that kind of stuff, I completely understand. It's a struggle, but at the same time, um, you know, there are other avenues. Um, for example, uh, only one person has asked for a recommendation from me, and he was actually a UCI alumni, but I worked with him a lot um, through um, the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, um, the club at UCI, the chapter there. And because I worked with him a lot through the organization, um, I wrote him a recommendation. And so even if it's not somebody who directly you work with, somebody who, um, or it's not even directly in your organization, somebody who has been impacted by your work can leave a stellar review that showcases a lot about your abilities. So I would say just start there and start um, seeing who you work with, who you research for, who if, if you have, um, uh, uh, if you're a master's candidate and you have a um, PhD candidate who was supervising your work when you were in an undergrad program or something like that, um, that still shows a lot of uh, value. So it seems like, you know, if you are taking a recommendation, let's say in a lab environment from your postdoc or a PhD candidate, if you're an undergrad mm -hmm. or let's say, you know, junior grad student, you should, we should probably ask them to um, impress upon certain skills which are probably relevant and they can be connected with an evidence on your LinkedIn profile, right? Because I've seen a lot of LinkedIn profile with recommendations letter by someone from the same lab and it almost sounds like you were you really pushed them and forced them to write something and then it sounds like totally irrelevant like i worked with her and her and was great her and would make offers for me and then you know her and never said no to anything i asked her to do I, I believe that's not what we are looking for we're looking for okay friend is a great scientist it was a pleasure working with him and things like that right right and it, like i say don't force it like if you yeah. force it it's yeah. not gonna come out it's not going to sound good to whoever's reading it. Um, you know, it, it really just depends. But at the same time, like I would say, it doesn't hurt to ask. Um, if they say no, it says no. Um, but that's the worst that can happen. You just don't get a recommendation for that particular person. Mm -hmm. It's better to try. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, there are, oh, wow, there are a lot of questions coming up. Uh, Jasmine, just want to make sure, do you have enough time? Would you be able to stay for like 10 more minutes to ask answers? Yeah. Something? Absolutely. It's Thank my you. pleasure. I'm having, I'm having a blast. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you very much. Um, Lauren, feel free to jump in if you are getting any separate questions. Then it seems like there's a flurry of questions. Uh, which, do you want to go ahead, Lauren, and ask? Sure. Some? Yeah, I think we Thank have um, two that we can combine here. Um, so on your profile, how do you feel about adding you know, resumes, slide decks, things like that? And kind of similarly, are, are badges for skills worth it? So when a recruiter is mm -hmm. reading do they value those additional pieces? Yes, all of those things, yes. Um, if you can add your resume, that's going to fast track the process too, um, because recruiters will directly have your contact information. They can download your skills. Um, they don't have to necessarily wait for you to respond to an email. There's no, there's actually even less hesitation with reaching out. So to give you perspective too, LinkedIn um, has a cap on how many in-mails a recruiter can send. Um, so you, you can't just send mass in-mails to 10,000 people. You have to really, I think it's, um, it depends on the subscription you pay for in your company, um, but it, um, depending on what your company pays for, you can have 100 in-mails a month. You can have uh, 500 emails a month. You can have 1,000 emails a month. So it really just depends. But if you have your resume on your profile, they don't need to send an email to you. Um, they can just get your contact information directly and download that. Um, you can also always leave your contact information in your summary section in your bio, um, which would also fast track the process. Badges, presentations, also fantastic. Um, it showcases your work, it shows your abilities, it shows um, your analytical skills, your organization skills, all of that. Um, it shows, I always say, if you are open to showcasing your work, um, your research, your thesis, all of that, I would say if you, are, if you are okay with it, put it on there. I'm just a little worried in case people 
don't feel comfortable. And so I don't want to advertise to do that. But if you are, it does work in your favor. Great, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I think one of these is, is probably going to be uh, dependent on the posting, but publications in LinkedIn profile, it goes down to the bottom. It's probably one of the last things that's listed. Um, is there value for recruiters to see publication lists? Yeah, I would say put it there because um, your publication was your sweat and tears. It's your baby. You have to put it there. Um, it's um, I think people know how much goes into your publications and your posters and your research papers and you, you know, anything that you work on that has your name, that has your cho comma jasmine on it, I would say put it on, on there. Um, it shows a lot of value and it shows how involved you are. It shows how you supported other papers, how you, um, you know, there's just so much value to it. I would say add it. Yeah, and I think it, it, I would like to say something at at here because as Jasmine mentioned that this, you have put in a lot of your sweat and blood into it. So although on LinkedIn thing the publication is really really at the bottom, you can actually showcase that in your experience section when you're talking about your postdoc mm -hmm. or PhD work. When you're going to say like you know, excellent communication skills, you know, or written skills, that's where you put like two or three or whatever number of uh, high impact peer reviewed publications in international journals. And then, if possible, yeah. you could link it also. Thank you. I think that was a very good question and answer. Go yeah, ahead. totally right. Um, I can go ahead. Catherine has a question. How much do you value online certifications? I get answer is yes, but I want you to say something, especially in areas like public speaking or management. We know the answer, but I think, Jasmine, it would be nice if you say something about it. Yeah, I think it's important. Um, and nowadays you can, um, like whether those are um, certifications from like specific institutes or even through LinkedIn Learning, um, I'm sure you see that often popping up. Um, you can gain badges through it. And it shows not only that you completed the skill, but that you are taking an additional step to further yourself, to develop yourself. And I think that speaks tremendous volume. Um, I always try to look at traits. Um, I think skills can definitely, like, of course, they're so important, but a lot of things can be learned and taught on the job, whereas skills are, you know, they're ingrained in you, it's harder to teach, and showing that additional initiative to go beyond, uh, you know, your amazing publications and your work, um, but to show that professional development side, I think it's fantastic, and it gives you an additional, like, if you're, if this is the base for hitting the job with all the requirements, it puts you up here if you have additional, um, you know, initiatives. Great. Uh, there is a question. Is it all right to have my work experience on my LinkedIn profile be very similar to my resume? Yeah, I think it's totally fine. Um, I'd say it can be the same. <laughs> um, your LinkedIn profile doesn't have to be as descriptive um, how, as your resume or your CV. However, I would say it can be, it can pretty much mirror each other. Nowadays, um, you can apply to jobs with easy apply on LinkedIn, so you don't even have to send your resume in, you just share your profile. So it's technically serving as a resume nowadays. Um, so I would say either way works. Okay. This, not, okay. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go okay, ahead. Uh, along the same lines, we have a question about if you're open to several opportunities, right? So if you're mm -hmm. applying to lots of different industries or different job titles, is there a way to keep your profile open but still have the necessary content? So I guess what would be the most important content to keep on there? Yes. So in that case, I would keep your um, LinkedIn profile a little bit more general. Don't keep it too specific. Um, do like a catch-all. So there are things I'm sure you're still looking at a particular type of job, even if it's not like you're not looking for a sales job and an engineering job and a, um, you know, a marketing job. You're looking for like a specific type of job. So keep it kind of open in that category. Still highlight your experiences, but your resume is where you're really going to cater it to each particular job. Um, so when I help my friends out with their resumes or students with their resumes, I always say, we're going to create three different resumes minimum. Um, we're going to do this one to this job. We're going to do this one to this other job. And we're going to do the last one to this type of job. And so at least you have three buckets of which you can open yourself to opportunities um, and submit those in. I know it's resume 
creating is so boring and so tedious, but like if you put in just one hour of work to creating three different resumes, it's going to um, be so much more fruitful than sending a generic resume to every single position. Yeah, that's it. That was a very good question. And I think this gets asked a lot. Thank you, Jasmine. There's one more thing I have heard from, uh, and I've done that myself also. Um, I'm sure everyone knows on Google, there's something called as uh, word cloud. So what you can do mm -hmm. is, let's say if you're interested in medical science liaison, medical writer, or, or like, you know, some of the research company based, uh, you know, positions, you can copy paste all the job descriptions from there into word cloud and see how many keyword skills pop up and see how many times they're asked. So you can adjust your LinkedIn profile based on those keywords so that, as Jasmine, you said that you, it has to be more generic, but at the same time, it should be focused on two or three job posts you're interested in. And because they will be related, as you said, you're not gonna be going working in McDonald's uh, and applying for a medical science liaison job, right? Right. <laughs> and that's complete, I completely agree with you, Harinder, yeah. Uh -huh. We have one question, sorry that got missed earlier. This is related to uh, international students and employees. Uh, I guess, uh, let me see if I can combine. Okay, so do you think the pandemic will influence companies hiring international students? Which I guess means that you know international people, they need visa sponsorship and things like mm -hmm. that. How do recruiters view uh, people who might need sponsorship visa? Right, so that's kind of a really tough subject because of not only the pandemic, but because of the current um, administration. Um, so I think everyone's been kind of hearing how difficult it is to get visas right now. Um, student visas, so those are F1 OPTs, those are generally much easier to get. So you still have, and then if you add your STEM extension on top of that, that's another two years. So you still have a good three to five years that you can still be working and hopefully there are administration changes, there are, um, you know, the whole um, working abroad process becomes a lot easier and COVID is a little bit, you know, pushed down. But with your current um, student visa and the STEM extension, you still have three to five years. Um, and that three to five year visa, um, employers don't pay a single penny. Um, they just support your growth. Um, all of that is there. So that should not affect you at least until you need a separate type of visa. Um, I'm not a attorney, employment attorney, so I don't know how much I should be. I don't take my word for everything, but um, when it gets to the H-1B visa or an L-1 visa, like different types of visas, it can be a little bit more difficult because at that point, the employer does have to sponsor you in um, monetary ways. Um, so it really is up to the company, but generally if your skill set is something that um, we cannot find, that's a no-brainer, right? Um, if you bring that value, if you bring that thing, we are we should be able to tell the government we need this person due to this specific skill set that is difficult to find amongst U.S. citizens, and like employers will generally fight for you in that case. Um, like our company definitely does. We have a bunch, we have a lot of people who are currently going through the immigration process who we're sponsoring. Um, Right now, um, we do bring on a lot of when, on OPT students. Um, it really just depends. However, generally, um, it's dependent on the company culture. There are companies who never would have sponsored, who never will sponsor. It just really depends. Um, but I would say talk to your recruiter about it early on in the process. Um, ask, hey, I'm a, uh, you know, what are your opportunities for sponsorship? Like, what are your opportunities for relocation? You know. All of those are conversations to have so that you don't waste your time interviewing and you don't waste your time, um, you know, trying to please this recruiter when they weren't, they have no intentions in the beginning. I would say be transparent. I would like to add one resource for that. All the international folks who are interested in this and they are applying for a certain company, there's a website called myvisajobs.com. So just go on that and there's a list of companies and there's a search bar. You can just type in the name of the company like Allergan or Abby, and it'll tell you if that company has ever sponsored H1B visa or OPT or anything in the past. And it'll also tell you how many visas they have sponsored and how recently they have sponsored. So it'll give you an, an, an insight into if they do it or not or how recently they've done it or if they're still doing it. 
So that's one thing I would think uh, look into. Second thing, there are a lot of uh, uh, immigration lawyers who are happy to give you free advice. Make use of that 30 minute free consultation session. So just, you know, use it as much as you can. Lauren, go ahead. Sorry, you have a question. Yeah, no, not at all. I just want to be cognizant of time as well. We are at one o'clock, so I want to um, make sure those who need to get out of here um, can. But we do have one last question, and I think um, it, it probably will be easy one. It's more of a settings question. And so we have someone who is moving back home um, in a different country, and I think it could be relevant for even if you're just moving across you know, to a different state. Um, if we've activated open to new opportunities and we've listed um, the new area that we're going to be at there, is that sufficient or should we also change our general area to that new location as well? I would say um, it depends on how soon you're looking to move, but I would just change it, your general area to the location that you're planning on moving to as well. That way when people look for you, it's very direct. You can also add it in your um, summary that currently I'm living here, but within this month, I'll be in this lo new location um, and I'm currently um, you know, looking for new opportunities in that location. Great, thank you so much. Looks like that's all the questions. Not that that was a short list by any means. So thank you so much, Jasmine, for taking all those and being willing to share your insights. Um, any, any last comments you'd like to make? No, I just want to thank everybody, all the students, uh, Harinder, Lauren, Carol, everyone for just having me, hosting me. Um, I had a blast and I always think very, very highly of UCI. Uh, and I'm very excited that we were able to have this conversation. And if anybody has any additional questions, you can find me on LinkedIn and feel free to reach out to me with anything as well.